rule of law, meritocracy, economic inclusion, and overall stability in the region and the COVID-19 crisis has only underscored the weaknesses in the public administration systems of the region. The economists and researchers of the International Monetary Fund have recently published a new on economic governance reforms to support inclusive growth in the Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. And I happen to have the report in front of me. The, in, the full text of the report is available at uh, imf.org. And to help us better understand the key findings pertinent uh, to our region, Central Asia and the Caucasus, I am joined today by Mr. Zain Zidane, the Deputy Director of the uh, Middle East and Central Asia Department at the IMF. Mr. Zidane, good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. And before we dive into the discussion, I would like uh, to tell our viewers that we will be collecting questions throughout the event. Uh, so you can send your questions uh, via the Zoom chat and on the IMF's Facebook pages in English and Russian, and I will make sure to ask them. Mrs. Zidane, uh, the new IMF report came out in January. What was the motivation for the report? So uh, for the, the last uh, three, two to three years, we at the IMF, we really um, uh, ramped up our engagement on governance uh, issues. Um, we, we, we came to the conclusion that it's really very hard to ensure macroeconomic stability, as you said at the beginning, and also to spur inclusive growth without a good governance framework. So, and so we, we put it as at the center of our now policy advice to countries. So, and to prepare for the, for, uh, to support our country teams and to support the authorities in the region, in your region, we, 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 we thought it would be very good to have, to look to the, to the situation in the region and come up with some of the policy recommendation on which uh, country authorities, but also uh, our country teams can, can build on. Uh, just let me say a few words about what I see as benefits of good governance and just few, give you a few examples. So, first, it's, it's, it's very critical to have a good governance framework in, in order to raise enough government revenue to finance investment and in, in infrastructure and human capital development in, in the region. And just to give you a number, we did a fiscal monitor a few years ago and we found out that globally, countries lose around $1 trillion every year because of corruption. So it's really very important to, do, to, to strengthen governance and the anti-corruption framework to be able to have collect enough revenue to be able to spend them. Now spending, we also discover that obviously sp spending efficiency depends a lot on the, on the governance framework. So, and, and if you really wanna uh, uh, reach your goals through spending, you need to, to strengthen significantly your governance framework and also the delivery of public services, the trust of uh, the public in, 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 the, in the way the government operates. Third, it's really very important if you want to attract private investment, increase your competitiveness, it's really very important to have, as you said at the beginning, the rule of law, to have a framework that actually allow. And finally, what we also discover is policymakers want to do reform. But the payoff of reform, if you want to really do reform to pay off, if you want to do open markets or do things, it's very important to have a strong governance framework. Because if you don't have a strong governance framework, economic agent in particular firm won't believe you. So, so it's, it's very important to have, so it's a kind of catch 22. So if you don't have a strong governance framework, you may not actually, even if you do reform, you may not get the payoff you, you, you were expecting from reform. And indeed the paper clearly demonstrate the relationship between lower corruption, higher government revenue, higher uh, public investment ex uh, efficiency and better education outcomes uh, in, in the, as, as you can see in the report. Uh, Mr. Zidan, vulnerability to corruption has been uh, a long-standing challenge for the region. Yes. Yes. Uh, and how do you think the pandemic uh, makes this issue more urgent uh, for these countries? You're absolutely right. The, the pandemic has really made this urgent everywhere, 
and in particular in rural region. Everywhere it has become really very urgent. I, I would say for two reasons. So policymakers need now to address the crisis, to address the health crisis and economic fallout, which means that people need really to have health, health service that they trust. They need to have a vaccination rollout that, that also they can trust. They need to have financial support to those who need it, firms and households. And, and for that, you need to have also a lot of efficiency in the way you do it. Otherwise, it's, it's difficult to. If you really want to address uh, the health crisis and its economic fallout, you need to have a very strong fr frame, governance framework. And this is why at the IMF, we, you know, what, when the crisis hit, we decided to provide a lot of emergency financing to our members, including three countries in your region, um, uh, in particular, uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, Kyrgyz Republic, uh, Tajikistan, so provided emergency financing to, to, to our members uh, in order to help them address the crisis. And for that, usually we ask every country that came to us for emergency financing to do three things. First, to be really transparent on what they allocate for, for, the, for, her, for COVID spending. Second, to be really transparent in terms of procurement. So every, so every procurement, every contract should be done in a transparent manner and the beneficial ownership of the company that, that was awarded the, the, the contract should be available. So you, know, you should know to whom we, 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 the gover government actually provided the, 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 the signed, signed with contract. And third, you need to have to keep what the, our managing director call keep the receipt. You need to, to, to do to, to, have, to keep the receipt and audit them by an independent organization. So this is really very critical if you want to address the crisis, the health crisis, you need to have a good, good governance and anti-corruption framework. You need, you need, people need to, re, to, lives depend on that. So if you really save lives, protect the livelihoods of people, you need to have a strong governance, governance framework. Second, think after the crisis. After the crisis, people will be, will be so we'll have two situations. One, we will have a lot of debt vulnerabilities and fiscal pressures, because you can see in your region, that has already increased by five percentage point. For those who are oil importers in your region who have less resources, that has already increased by 13% only in 2020. So you will have countries with limited fiscal space. So they need to do more with less resources. And so, so no country actually can afford wasting scarce resources. So going forward, you will need to do better with, with limited resources and that is very, governance is, at the heart of that. Second, countries will be, will be competing to attract private investment, to do economic transformation after the crisis. And to do that, you need really to have strong governance framework. Those countries who, have, who are less prone to corruption will certainly have a leg up in this race to, 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 uh, to, 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 to the recovery. So Mrs. Zidane, we're talking about a significant region with encompassing eight countries, five countries in Central Asia, three countries in the Caucasus, and each of the countries have their own, as you have mentioned, set of challenges. And while Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan may have uh, better access to resources to respond to the crisis, smaller economies like Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan who are dependent on remittances are experiencing uh, greater budgetary constraints but also um, countries like Azerbaijan and Armenia, on top of the effect mm. of the pandemic, are now faced to deal with the challenges of post-war recovery. Uh, so taking mm. all these challenges in mind, all these uh, country-specific uh, elements in, in, in mind, how do you think the governments in, these, in this region are faring, with the, with, uh, faring in terms of corruption and governance? Yeah. So, so I think all this, this uh, so both the point you're making on, on, on um, limited resources, but also the need to, uh, to, to deal with uh, post-conflict issues, really, uh, as, as we were saying a bit before, make, the, make improving governance and, 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 and fighting corruption a high priority. Uh, so for the, how the region fares overall, I would say the, there are the positive news and the, I would say less positive news. Let me start by the positive news. The positive news is that 
many of many countries in your region have started already implementing governance and anti-corruption framework, which is positive. I can give you a few, few examples. As you know, Georgia is one of the leading countries in the region and even globally. So they have really reformed their tax system, imp improved the business environment, uh, strengthened their public financial management. And you can see that in their numbers, both macro economic numbers, but also in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the governance indicators, they are really do doing very well. They are, are topping the region, I, I would say, in terms of, of governance framework. Kazakhstan also has made a lot of effort recently. So obviously, they, so few examples, they improved the access to, uh, to budget information. So now you have, you have the, they put in place an anti-corruption framework. They, uh, they have also put in place this, this, this network of public service centers that actually um, make it easier to, for, people to, for people and firms to access to public services. All these are good things because the less you have uh, gatekeepers or restriction to, for people to get access to public services, the less you have vulnerabilities to corruption. So they are, they are doing good, good, these are good development in the region. Also on procurement, many of the, your country, countries in your region made reform, uh, have, have undertaken reform or are still undertaking reform. I can cite Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan again, Kyrgyz Republic, Uzbekistan, and more recently, Tajikistan are also ramping up their procurement reform, um, including doing developing the e-procurement system where you can really harness technology to have full transparency on the process, less interaction between bidders and, 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 and civil servants. So we, all these are very, very, very good things. And for example, Kyrgyz Republic also approved, adopted an, an asset declaration regime, which is something I, I will talk a little bit about it, but it's also the case, the, the case in Kazakhstan. So that's are the good news. So you have a lot of the past few years, we've seen reforms happening in the region. This is really very positive and, and we should acknowledge that. At the same time, uh, as you can see in, from all indicators, the region is still lagging its peers. And uh, also, also as shown in the paper, you have a few charts in the paper that shows that actually the average in the region is actually much lower than the, their own, their, their comparators, their peers. So, uh, and that is in particular in terms of control of corruption. And in control of corruption, you've seen probably the data coming recently from Transparency International, that actually the latest survey that put the region as the second worst in terms of corruption, which is something that the countries need to really to address. Governance, government effectiveness, uh, regulatory quality, rule of law, all, all, all these indicators, the region is still, and it's shown in the paper, it's still, still uh, lagging the rest, the, rest of, uh, the rest of the world, in particular their own peers. As you have mentioned, with the exception of Georgia, the rest of the countries in the region score quite low in the corruption perceptions ranking by the Transparency International, unfortunately. So what are the key recommendations and policy advice to the regional governments uh, in curbing corruption and improving governance? So I would, so we, we, so we first I, I would really uh, start by saying Go, uh, fight, improving governance and fighting corruption is a long-term endeavor. So it's not something that you can achieve overnight. Second, it also needs uh, a national, national engagement where all stakeholders are actually involved. So you need not only uh, the government putting in place the right reform to allow things to, to the governance to be improved, but also you need a, a private sector that want to participate in that, want to have civil society that is also has access to information, is vocal in, in really in, in reform. And you need media like you who actually can shed light on, on, on good reforms, build coalition around reforms, but also create, create demand for reform in, in, in countries. So you need, you need all national stakeholders to be engaged. And obviously the international community can come, they cannot change what happen, is happening in the ground, but they can support what is happening in the ground. And also we can certainly support that uh, the, the fight, so the, the, global, the, international, the global fight against corruption, and I will say a few words about it when, when we, when we when, if I have the opportunity to talk about the role of the IMF on, to, on all of this. 
In terms of reform, we have three major recommendations. First, transparency, improving transparency and accountability. If you make everything transparent, so the sun, the sun is the best really uh, acceptizer if you want to. So if you really want to make uh, certain governance, you, you start by making everything transparent. So people can access information, people can help, help government, government accountable. So transparency and accountability. And for that, four, four or five recommendations. First, budget and central bank information should be made completely transparent. And so, so people need to see what is in the budget, how the budget is implemented, uh, the, the outcome of, of the, the, the implementation of the budget. So they need to really be able to monitor and, and, and evaluate what's, what's, what's going on. Second, you need in pro procurement is one of the main sources of corruption in, in, in government. So you need really to have open, transparent procurement processes. And something that we are really pushing for is publication of contracts and get the information on the beneficial owners of this contract, because that's the best way to make sure that if there is a conflict of interest between the company getting the contract and the, the, the government official who is giving the contract, you can see the information. So it's very important to see, to see the beneficial ownership of this contract. Third, really strengthening all the control. So the, international, the internal controls in, in implementing, executing the budget, but also uh, the external control. So to have the parliament overseeing the implementation of the budget, to have a, a supreme audit court, uh, audit institution, or have a, an auditor general that actually can look to the implementation of the budget uh, and, and, and state owned enterprise. Fourth, something that really we're pushing for is also strengthening financial disclosure. So it's important that public officials, in particular uh, high officials, should actually publish information on their assets. So declare their asset, publish information on their assets. And there should be an institution that is able to see when someone takes office, what, what are the assets she or he has. And when he leaves the office, so to be able to compare, and you know, you have countries like Singapore, where if you cannot explain the change in your assets, you have to f first pay the treasury, bring the money to the treasury, the difference to the treasury, and then explain after that. So you need really to have strong transparency in the asset declaration regime to be able to. So the first one is really transparency and accountability. Second, you make rules, so streamlining rules and enforcing them well. So the, the, the less you have complexity in rules, the better it is and the easier it is. So if you, for example, are a company that you want to start a business, if starting a business takes only one, one step, so you have, it's, it's, it becomes easier. It's become easier for investors to do, but you have less people to deal with. And so you have less vulnerabilities to corruption. So the, the less you have, the less complexity you have, the better you have in terms of economic outcome. And, and so the lower risk are the risk uh, to, 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 to corruption. And third, you need really to have a strong anti-corruption framework. An anti-corruption framework, which means you have an anti-corruption legislation, that is based on international convention, like the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and others. You need to have a strong uh, anti-corruption uh, law. You need to have to enforce the law. And I, I can see in your region, there are some action in terms of enforcement that are really uh, to, be, to be also um, praised. So it's very important to implement, to, to, when, you, when you catch someone doing something bad, it, it, it should have consequences, otherwise, Otherwise, you, it's, it, it can't be only about having an anti-corruption framework. And third, you need to have a strong anti-money laundering and, 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 and combating uh, financing of terrorism framework in, in your countries. For example, something that is important in terms of fighting corruption is to make sure that people who are politically exposed, politically exposed person, people who are in power, you need to be able actually to, to, to track their, 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 their financial flows. And if there are something that is suspicious to be able to report to the agency that is in charge of that. So it's important to strengthen the MLCFT. And obviously, uh, if you do that, you also be able to have share information with, with uh, domestic and international jurisdiction because that is something that is, uh, that is going to make it really very hard for people to do.
to 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 bribe or do 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 corruption acts. So so these are the three. So really, uh, just to summarize, transparency and accountability, simpler rule, and enforcing them very well, and a strong anti-corruption framework with enforcement. Now the COVID nineteen crisis has shown us all the weaknesses of our health systems, but it also exacerbated some of the existing inequalities and deepened socioeconomic the socioeconomic divide. Um, yes. And that, that is all leading to the public trust in government hitting the new low. And we mm -hmm. saw the greatest manifestation of public mistrust in a government uh, during the Kyrgyz um, revolution of 2020. Uh, what are the ultimate risks for governments at the moment of failing to ensure that the economic growth benefits are evenly and better distributed within societies. So, so it's it's really uh, as you said, we we've seen uh, not only in your region but in other regions uh, high inequality um, uh, leading to uprising, to to violence, to to political instability, and ultimately uh, macroeconomic instability and 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 low economic growth. And so, really. A vicious cycle after so where inequality lead to 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 instability and 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 instability lead ultimately to 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 all all these things. So I think really it's 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 a very important question, and and frankly again governance and corruption are critical. Uh, governance and anti-corruption uh, are critical to this to really have a, bring back trust in the way the government works and for people to to clearly see that government is working for them as a, as people and not working for for themselves as public 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 officials so that's 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 really rebuilding that this trust is very important as i said also it's 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 going really to be a national endeavor and 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 institution like yours, in particular, uh, media and social and civil society organization, play really a critical role in in relaying the views of the people, but uh, and creating some some stronger demand on reform from the government side. But if you see the government also doing the right thing, supporting the government to be able to build coalition around reforms and to make things happen. Mr. Zidane, uh, the IMF has notably focused on uh, the opportunities afforded by digitalization. And how do you think digitalization helps fight corruption in the region? Digitalization, you've seen during the COVID crisis, uh, digitalization has been really critical to even doing business. We're today talking uh, talk, talking uh, virtually, so uh, and so it's going to really it's, it's, it has changed the way we do we do a lot of things and 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 it, and, and technology is really critical and can be uh, can be uh, a critical tool really to get where we we, we want to go in terms of governance and anti-corruption. Let me give you a few examples. So first, we, we've been talking at the beginning about access to information. And obviously, technology can allow everyone to access information on your phone, on your, uh, on whatever, on your, on, on your tablet, on your, on your screen, on your TV. So it's really important to have, it will be, it, it can provide a full access to information. And you have initiative actually that global initiative to try to support this. So in terms of critical access to information, ability to monitor what the government is doing this is a uh, technology is going to be very very important now technology is also uh, going to so e government services will allow actually to make to do a lot of good good things uh, and in a more efficient manner so for example right now you can file and pay your taxes electronically so you don't have to you can use the digital technology to do that you can use te digital technology today to, to, to do procurement. So without any contact between the bidder and, and the, the government, and without a contact between the taxpayer and the guy who, who is in charge of collecting taxes. So, so opportunities for corruption will disappear with technology because basically you're doing things virtually. So it's the it's, it's same thing also. Many countries will be able, we've seen, for example, during this crisis, uh, 
so people people during this crisis people in, in some countries you will government were able actually to provide the transfer directly to, to to the household on their own phone you have your money going to your so you don't have the middleman that in the middle is going really to benefit from the from corruption so so basically the technology will will allow to do a lot of e government service in a manner that reduce vulnerability to corruption and third is going really to be artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency some of these things are going really to help you to help a lot of countries to be able to track fraud in general so you can really be able to see whether this guy is getting two salaries there or this guy is not coming to the or this service is not the right service. so you will have a lot of the, or this contract is not has has problems so you will be able really to do with artificial intelligence to to track fraud to be able to do uh, uh, to also to track illicit flows to do a lot of things that actually uh, technology is, go, are, is is going to be able to provide more and more so technology is going really harnessing technology will be countries that will be able to harness technology will certainly be able to reduce significant vulnerability to corruption and be able also to uh, easily detect detect corruption and 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 so and act act on that so technology is going definitely to be uh, to be critical to to strengthening governance and fighting corruption in the world uh, Mrs. Zidan, with this uh, pandemic, uh, which has actually uh, brought a lot of turmoil and, and uh, economic challenges, uh, it has also urged uh, civil societies and media and, and general public to mobilize around demanding uh, transparency and accountability uh, at this moment, at this time. Uh, there are groups of volunteers supervising the uh, public spending, and there are more and more people interested uh, in ensuring that the public spending information is actually published uh, in the timely manner. And how is the IMF currently engaging with governments uh, in this matter in, in ensuring that these recommendations are taken into account? And how responsive are the policymakers in the region to the recommendations? So, uh, so let me uh, first explain the, the way the, the IMF work with, uh, with countries. So we work with countries on, we, we provide three basic services. Uh, the first one is really policy advice. And we do policy advice through what we call Article 4 consultations, which we do with every member country. And we, we with all countries in the region, we, 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 we've done, Article 4 consultation since the new, new, new policy. So, and basically uh, in that discussion with the authorities, we look to what are the main, the key governance weaknesses, and we come up with recommendation in ways to strengthen that. For example, if you look to the Article 4 with Kazakhstan, you will see some, you will see an annex on, on, on go strengthening governance and anti-corruption framework, which is part of the staff report and written in the in the document that we 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 we, we bring to our board and in the discussion we have with the authorities. So we, we have we have substantive discussion right now with all your countries in the region on these governance issues. And while doing that, we also talk not only to the government, but we talk to civil society when, once our mission is on the field. They, they talk to the government, they talk to the private sector, they talk to the civil society, and sometimes they have the chance to talk to, 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 to also uh, speak to you and, 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 and your colleagues uh, in, during the mission. So we have a dialogue with authorities, what we call the policy advice we provide to the authorities, that, that is. Uh, second role that we have is technical assistance. We help a lot of countries through technical assistance, through training, to actually strengthen their own institution. So sometimes it will tell us, yes, we want to strengthen our anti-money laundering um, uh, framework, but we want your help. And so we'll come, we'll help them have the law, we'll help them set up an anti-financial uh, integrity unit in their own system. So we will help them, we help them actually to strengthen the, 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 their framework. And we do that in terms of fiscal governance, the way they run their fiscal policy, we, run, we help central banks, we help them the way they regulate the financial sector, we help them in providing, strengthening the statistical system so they can provide information 
that information can be accessible. So we do that technical assistance, which is also important. The third thing that we do is for countries that, as you said at the beginning, some of the countries in the region don't have enough resources. So, so they need financing from the IMF to help them uh, deal with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, the situation. So, and in these cases, we have deeper dialogue on what is needed in terms of governance reform to be able to address the problem that 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 brought them to us. So, and and in these cases, we often put what we call conditionality condition on before disbursing before giving them the money, we need them to commit in general to address some of these key governance issues that we see as, as, as a problem. So, uh, and so that's basically three ways we, we, we work with countries, but doing this, we always talk to different stakeholders at the start of the, at the beginning to make sure that we provide the best policy advice, informed not only about what we know, what the authorities will tell us, but also what other stakeholders will, will tell us. Uh, Mrs. Zidan, we have received a few questions from our viewers and my colleagues, uh, journalists from other countries as well. Uh, Mir Saeed Ibrahim Zadeh from APA News Agency, Azerbaijan, has two questions. Which policy recommendations from the recent paper could be the most efficient and applicable in Azerbaijan to accelerate a post-war recovery? And mm -hmm. the second question is, what do you think about the recent anti-corruption reforms in Azerbaijan? Are they bearing fruit? So I would say it's 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 uh, it's important that uh, so Azerbaijan is a country that has um, a lot of resources. They have uh, large fiscal buffers because they have a sovereign wealth fund that, that with 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 enough resources. Um, so what I would really uh, st start by recommending is for them really to have uh, at least two things. First, really make sure that they have full transparency in the way they, they, they run the, 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 the economy. So really the, some of the recommendation I did on transparency, in particular, for example, on public procurement. And usually when you have after a conflict, you have some reconstruction efforts. So it's important that the procurement, procurement is done in a very transparent manner. And also that the information on beneficiaryship and others can be available on, 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 that, on that floor. The second uh, is that, uh, is that uh, he also raised the question on the anti-corruption. So it's really important to have, it's not only having laws, having an anti-corruption agencies, but it's also very important to enforce the, 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 the framework that you have. And, and so enforcement of the framework doesn't mean that you should really be uh, attacking the people who have no protection or are, uh, it, it should really be implemented uh, fairly uh, across, across the board. So to be really a credible policy and, and, and bear, bear fruit, fruit. That said, I, as I said at the beginning, Governance and anti-corruption reforms are a long endeavor, and you will not see really. It will take time to change substantially the 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 the, the governance indicators in many of these countries because it takes time really to 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 see the benefit of, of of these reforms. So so we will be patient, but what is important is really to to undertake the the reforms and undertake them in a credible manner. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question from Irakli Kotitashvili, UNDP. Mm -hmm. Dig digitalization of public services delivery is key to preventing corruption. Mm -hmm. However, internet access is still a considerable hurdle in the region. Mm -hmm. How can we provide a better internet accessibility so that we don't leave anyone behind? No, I. I this is really a very, very good question. So my director is uh, made an interview recently and he said you have a three pluses for a, for a technology and you have one minus. And the minus obviously is we don't want technology, the, 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 the technological gap or divide to be, or the internet gap and divide will be something that is going to further uh, worsen inequality. Inequality between countries but also inequality within countries. Because as you said, 
countries that will have less less bandwidth or less internet access will be certainly uh, at the disadvantage compared to countries with the better internet access. But also household kids during this crisis who don't have really internet in their household are also going to be to be more affected by lockdown and by the crisis that actually kids who have better access to internet. So it's really important to have a strong, so an, an IT policy in every country. So you need to develop an IT strategy in every country and make sure that you address the bottleneck to develop, the, to, to have a better access to internet, not only for the few, but uh, for, for, for all. So they, really it's, it's important to address this, uh, to, to avoid to have tomorrow the technological gap really create worsening inequality rather than helping to, 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 to address it. So, so that's, that's a good question, but I think every country should really think about it and develop a good um, ICT strategy, I would say, to, to, to address the issue. So then there's one more question, last one, and I think uh, part of the uh, things said about in the question you have already touched upon, in countries where state capture is extremely high, mm -hmm. undermining and weakening the supply side of reform that you mainly focused on your presentation, what do you recommend to be done and what is the IMF's role and the tools uh, to support demand for anti-corruption reform in these countries? And, uh, the second part of the question, I believe you have already touched upon. Yeah. So, so I think you know, it's, 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 the 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 best way to crack state state capture again is transparency. Is every information is available, and and you have you have full transparency on who gets what. So basically, private sector cannot capture the officials because you will have information on, for example, on a procurement. Who is getting the contract? Who is really the, the beneficial owner of the contract? And who is giving the contract? So, so if you really have a strong transparency and, and, and framework, if you have if you strengthen transparency, you will be able really to crack the, the state capture. So that's that's the key things really to, to, to do there. Just on, on the role of the fund, I want to say one additional word on, on that 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 also is somewhat linked to the question. So in, in a lot of countries, people will tell us, uh, it's difficult for me to fight corruption because some of my officials are getting bribed by firms who are abroad and the money never came to my, to my own country so I can see it through my MLCFT framework or something. The money is also parked somewhere in a financial center abroad. Okay. So this is, this is really a, a, a true problem. So, because many countries actually don't have the way to, 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 to deal with this problem. So it's, it's a global problem. It's, it's, that requires global cooperation. And so I can tell you that the fund also has, is, is really working hard on this. What we did in our policy is to say that we're going to ask advanced economy, for example, and the G7 have agreed to do that to make sure that these countries have a strong anti-bribe framework to, to make sure that companies cannot bribe foreign officials. So a company in the United States cannot bribe foreign officials, a foreign official somewhere else. And that the financial centers in these countries cannot be used to conceal the corruption proceeds on these things. So, so you need to have some kind of a global cooperation to make sure that developing countries who even some, some of them want to do, to do reforms, and, and you, you often hear about government coming after, uh, a new government coming after another, but not able really to also uh, track what happened with the government before them, and or government saying, we wanna do things, but we cannot control it. So it's really a global problem. And at the IMF, we're working a lot on this, also this dimension of transnational, aspect of corruption. So it's not only about one nation, it's about what happened between two nations or a few nations uh, in, a, in, in, in a bribery or something like that. So, so this is something we're also working on it in parallel. Uh, uh, so I, I didn't want to talk about it because you asked me about the nations, what we do at the national, national level. 
but we do, do also a lot of things on the transnational level. Mr. Zidane, we're running out of time. Uh, this has been a very insightful and a timely conversation. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'd like to thank um, all the viewers for joining, uh, for those of you who sent your questions as well, and the IMF team for organizing the event. And I look forward to more conversations like this uh, in the future. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you.